Hi, everybody. Welcome to VMware Explore 2023. We're here live at uh, the Green Set with Rob Strecce, Cube Analyst, Dave Vellante here. This is our 13th year doing VMworld slash VMware Explore. Really the same event, they just changed the name. Double sets. It's actually quite an impressive show. You know, last night, we, Rob, we were walking the show floor. A lot of customers here. The ecosystem's maybe a little bit smaller, but there were some big booths. You had, you know, some of the bigger partners. Uh, that you know you would expect Dell, HPE, IBM, Lenovo, NetApp, et cetera. Veeam had a had a big booth. Um, uh, Rubrik had a big booth, and, and several others. And it was packed. I mean, the customers are here in force. Maybe trying to figure out, okay, what's next for VMware? Uh, maybe they're up for renegotiating their ELAs. Maybe they want to hear, you know, what the future with Broadcom looks like. Or, you know, maybe there's just more of the same. But it was actually more vibrant than I had expected. Yeah, I think it was a good showing mm -hmm. uh, early on for them, pre-keynote and pre-understanding what's going on. I think getting in there with some of those actual customers and talking to them about what they're thinking about and how they see this playing out, to your point, what their expectations are. I think there is a lot of learning going on. I think there's also people looking at what their job is today and what their job may be tomorrow. And I think there's a little trepidation around that is, you know, hey, being a v VMware admin is not as sexy as being a cloud architect anymore. And how do you make that transition? And I think they're here to hear the multi-cloud story that's really, uh, you know, front and center. Rob, you and I and Zias wrote a breaking analysis this week. It's published on siliconangle.com and of course on our YouTube channels and LinkedIn and everywhere. Uh, but we said our expectations were, we, we, we said we're not going to hear much on the Broadcom acquisition. We heard more than we expected. Yeah. Bro Hawk Tan was here, he actually was on video, and then he stood up and waved in the, in the front row. He basically said, hey, we believe in this multi-cloud era, and you know, a lot of opportunity, and we're going to invest, I think he said $2 billion in R&D, and et cetera. So, you know, very strong message, an indicator that you know, obviously things are going well. We had spoken to some folks uh, privately yesterday who said, yeah, there's a couple little, little things we have to settle in the a a Asia PAC countries. We're going through that. The FTC, as we know, and we started out our pieces, continues to drag its feet, but there's no reason why they won't right. you know, approve this thing. The European Competition Com Committee, the UK, rather, Competition Committee, approved it, I believe, yesterday. Just gave yesterday. their final approval. They had already given preliminary approval, so that's no surprise. So that's done, and we did an analysis in the financials, and we can talk about that. Uh, but the, the thing I want to talk to you about here is VMware's AI play. Um, we're going to talk about that. They, they, they kicked off the event with all the CEOs from all around Silicon Valley. Uh, who'd they have on there? They had... Uh, Adam uh, Saplinski. Uh, Adam Salipsky, they had Silicon Valley yeah. extended. Yeah. Satya, Satya was on there? Or no, uh, no. I Satya. seeing Satya. Uh, it was... Um, TK. Yeah, TK. Thomas Curian. Um, who else did we see on there? Um, uh, the head of R&D uh, group CTO, I think, at, or at Hugging Face. At Hugging Face, you had, uh, and of course you had Jensen on stage. Yeah. So they sort of had, uh, you know, some good AI action. But what we said was we're going to hear more about cross-cloud services, Tanzu and Aria, which they're basically bringing together, and developer extensions. Then we said incremental enhancements to the core. vSphere, vSAN, NSX. And we're going to talk about that yeah. quite a bit. We said, we, we, we I kind of had a question mark around it, I took it out, but around Project Monterey, our intent was, haven't heard much about that lately, and we still haven't heard much, and I don't think we will hear much. Uh, and in the ecosystem you know, showcase, which we can also talk about, but let's start with the core, the core incremental enhancements, vSphere, vSphere Plus, vSAN Max, NSX Plus, let's start with vSAN, because that's where VMware started. Yeah, I, and I think with vSAN, I think, it is more than an incremental, uh, I guess you could say, announcement that they are doing this disaggregated uh, storage play, where they're allowing you to grow storage separately from CPU and memory. Uh, I, th I think this is a direct shot at some of the other hyper-converged infrastructure players, HCI players that are out there. Uh, I think it's also a good way to be able to move between being, you know, you feel like you're stuck on a single box and be able to move your VMs very easily using storage vMotion. Uh, that being said, I think, you know, funny enough, I was at HPE 
you know, feels like decades ago, and it was almost a decade ago that we did HCI using store virtual underneath the hood and did disaggregated where you could have a separate box for storage and you could have vSphere on top of it. So I think a big piece of this is how really, you know, innovative is that? And I think it, it, it's good. I think it's a little late to the market. I think also it doesn't go far enough for the multi-cloud vision that they have. So hopefully I'm, we're going to see some of that $2 billion that was talked about going into, hey, let's make this a true platform that can compete with an S3 or an EBS or you know, an FSX type platform. So Rob, I remember when HP, and it was HP at the time, initiated that disaggregation of storage. Yeah. It was at a big data show, okay, where the term big data was in vogue. This is how long ago it was. And the guys came to me and said, you know, we know you've been talking about this problem of separating compute and storage. We're working on it. We have this, you know, skunk works, you know, you know and they were, wanted to pick my brain about it. This was like ancient history, yeah. to your point. And, and I looked at that, that announcement, I was like, wow, it's about time. I'm pretty sure I was on theCUBE in 2015 <laughs> talking about it, maybe in Barcelona, at VMworld Barcelona or something like that. I'll have to go back into the archives and look. <laughs> but I, I think, again, it's, it's definitely something that's needed. I think their customers will get great value out of it. I think it's a smart move on their part, but it's incremental. And, and I don't think it's earth shattering. It's still not filed for everybody, although you could theoretically use it. Object is through a, a partnership with like somebody like a MinIO, and really the block is only for vSphere. Uh, and again, you start to look at it and how they've closed off their ecosystem and how the API set in the storage is really closed off, and it has been for, since the EMC days, it started to close, they started to close the gaps, signing IO pads. I think the one thing, and you know, we heard about this, and we kind of just mentioned it before on uh, our other uh, keynote analysis is they are good at I.O. They can get high I.O. And I think that does play well for A.I. and what their pri private A.I. strategy is. But there's a gap between the I.O. and the actual application. And there's that data layer. So, speaking of I.O., so in, in, when, when VMware in the early part of the last decade, so kind of 20, 2010, 2011, even even before that, 20, 2008, 09, you know, 10, when they were really on the upswing, and, and I.O. was the big problem, right? And, and, and it was really complicated if, if something went wrong, and you had to bring in guys with lab coats to figure out what went wrong with your VMware environment, and so <clears throat> VMware initiated, and did a really, actually, really good job working with the storage companies. I think it was, originally was the VMware API for storage, and yep. then the VASA, VASA AP, API yeah. came out, and, and, and they pretty much released the SDK to all the majors anyway. Majors being, obviously EMC got it, because they right. owned them, uh, but, but HP, you know, uh, yeah. NetApp, well, certainly Well, Freepart Dell, was one of the first Freepart, in there. Yeah. they got it, yeah. they got the SDK, yeah. and they, they all worked really hard, and, and they'd be, they became really good at solving those IO problems. Yes. And it, it goes back to what Paul Moritz said, back in, I want to say, 2009, when he said, we're going to build a software mainframe. Right. That, the mainframe was really good at I.O. It was really good at, at, at minimizing the impacts of virtualization on performance. And that's essentially what, what VMware has done. Now, having said all this, I would, I would argue that during the EMC ownership years, when you talk to you know, the, the original folks that you know, it, it, you know, created you know, vSAN, um, they felt that they were handcuffed a little bit, that they couldn't just go off and attack the market opportunity because their owner wanted to preserve yeah. some of the revenue for themselves. So they, they sort of neutered vSAN and said, all right, keep it low end, make sure it doesn't scale too much, right? right. Don't encroach on our, on our block business. And now I feel like the handcuffs are off. Yeah, and I, I think for the last couple of years, that's why it's, they, this is a first salvo, I think, for them into competing potentially in software-defined arrays and being able to be on clouds with vSAN. Because right now, you can't, you, the only way you can get vSAN really is on-premise for that most part. Even they talked about there's ways to get some of the storage aspects of vSAN in cloud, but at the same time, it's under the hood of the different services. It's not there front and center. 
vSAN Max will not be in the cloud during this first release. And I think that's telling to potentially where their roadmap will take them. Yeah, so, and then the other two big core announcements, NSX Plus, which essentially is a, it's, it's a, it's a, a networking super cloud where they're abstracting the underlying primitives and eventually they'll go to the, all the public clouds and you know, they're going to take care of all that complexity. So there's, that's, that's, there's an allure there, but you know, NSX adoption needs to increase as, as we know <clears throat> and they've got you know, a lot of work to do there and of course vSphere Plus is, I mean that's the core. Yeah, and I, I think the NSX Plus is a place where I, I'm, I'm very positive on that direction. I, I see it as one of the hardest places for these cloud architects to play. The networking is still really tough to go and do. And I think, you know, especially if you talk about multi-cloud or cross-cloud, even if you're, say, in an Equinix, using VMware there and using VMware in uh, your say VMware on cloud, the VMC in AWS, it's still hard to make the VPCs and all of that work together, even with the physical links being there from Equinix. Yeah, that multi-cloud VPC, I mean, it, basically the core problem they're trying to solve, and they talked about this in their little breakouts yesterday, you need a common cloud operating model, There's that's super cloud, and DevOps wants to move fast. Right. right? So yeah. those, those are both true, Yes. And, and so you got to evolve NSX to NSX Plus, where it's got these, you know, kind of multi-cloud standardization. And I think, is, and I think it's moving it beyond just being a, a, a product to being a platform, and a platform as a service. And I think they look at what ha the clouds have done really well is simplifying it down to a couple clicks in, in the UI, in their console, and going and doing that. Now, how does that play if I'm going between one console and another console? Are you going to have consoles of consoles? And how do you do all this? Is it, are they going to automate all of that, that through the, you know, the Azure APIs and the Google APIs and the AWS APIs? They kind of have. They to. have to. Yeah. They have they, to. They, if they don't, then what's the real value? Exactly. It's just a manager of managers. Yeah. Right. They got to go beyond kind of policy management. They got to really really create that true multi-cloud abstraction layer. Yeah. And then there's a data lake, which is providing intelligence, which is very important to right. have the metrics. Um, let's talk a little bit about the AI play. Uh, you know, Jensen's on stage, they're betting a lot of their AI on, on NVIDIA, like a lot of companies. Right. You know, okay, that's a good bet. Uh, smart to be there. But, it's a but, safe bet. But it's a safe bet. Yeah. And you have to be there. It's almost like yeah. table stakes. It's not, it's not going to bring a ton of differentiation. Um, but you got to have it. And then their, 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 their database is Postgres, and I, go, I guess Greenplum, but Postgres is where they're starting. It's great, very functional and great Oracle alternative and, and, and relational you know, capabilities and fairly mature, very mature actually. <clears throat> and then they've got Hugging Face for their repo, and that's where ostensibly they're going to get access to, you know, customers will get access to multiple LLMs. I would say this, and we talked about this again in breaking analysis, the cloud vendors, and we've got you know, anecdotal evidence from some of the developers that, that we talked to, you in particular did this research, where they're saying, hey, I'm actually quite impressed with what I'm getting out of AWS. I got LLM optionality, I'm loving bedrock, I, 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 I'm, I'm playing with all these different LLMs, they're fenced off, the LLM vendors are fenced off from getting access to my customer's data, so that's a plus plus. I got encryption at rest, encryption in motion. I got all the cloud security, and I'm moving fast. It's making me productive. I'm putting out product. Yeah. We're actually we're going beyond MVP. So very, very high marks. What you hear from the on-prem crowd, HPE will have LLMs as a service in the fourth quarter. Right. Dell, we got Project Helix, and we got some reference architectures. You know, you got that same thing here. Um, we didn't hear LLMs as a service, but so, the point I'm trying to make here, Rob, is that the cloud has the advantage of innovation and speed. The one advantage, ostensibly, that the on-prem guys have is, and VMware trotted out its general counsel today and said, <laughs> we've got the FUD of fear, fear, uncertainty, and doubt of legal and compliance risk. So you better do this stuff on-prem, so wait for us. Yeah. But the market's not going to wait for them too long. No, I, I, I think it's a, it's a private versus uh, in the cloud type of, and I think it's private in cloud or private on-prem, and that's going to be some of the big 
choices that people have to make. I think that VMware did a good job of talking, you know, they, even in one of the slides had, you know, Dolly, Falcon, Llama. Uh, they talk about Platypus, no, I think it was Platypus or one of the, Platypus 2 from Boston University, Go Terriers, um, you know, but I think it's one of these things that when you start to look at how they're bringing it together, it's still a 60 page reference architecture. And I think it's going to have to be simpler to be a platform as a service like Bedrock is. If they really want to achieve where they're going in this market, they got to make it simpler. It, it, it just has to, it can't just be, yes, we use NVIDIA's workbench. You go in here and this is how you're going to keep it secure. And here, by the way, we encrypt it all, all the way through and confidential computing comes in there and how they're doing all of their encryption. So they do have a good story there that they can build upon and good infrastructure. I think it becomes a, can they make it simple enough to achieve that, to get there fast enough? I mean, the big concern I have is, is what is their differentiation in AI? Obviously they got <clears throat> great infrastructure and they can bring that infrastructure, you know, evolve VMware infrastructure so that it's, you know, capable of handling AI. I, I, don't, I don't question that, but there's, there, what the gap to me is the data play. Yeah. I'm going to bring my data to the cloud I'm going to bring my AI to the cloud because but A, AI is there, and B, my data is there. I'm going to bring my AI to Snowflake, which is also in the cloud, by the way, because my data is there. I'm going to bring my AI to Databricks, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, because my data is there. Now, VMware doesn't have a strong data play. Obviously, there's a lot of data moving around the VMware infrastructure, yeah. but it's not in a cohesive way. Yeah. There's no data platform play there, and so, I think they can build that, but it's got to be more than just, hey, we're doing Postgres. We gotta, they've got to have tighter relationships with the data platform players, and that means, that means database, that means governance, that means privacy, that means you know, data cleansing, data management, all that sort of ecosystem that exists that you see when you walk around Databricks and Snowflake shows and AWS and other, you know, Google will see it next week. <clears throat> That's lacking here. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're dead on, and I think they, they don't even have the story about how you can get at it with SQL or R, or how you go work in these other tool sets and use those to get at the data in vSAN. Because I think it was, the play is very similar that they have vSAN, now vSAN Max, it's going to be disaggregated. What if you put these, inter, you put these interfaces on top of it, SQL for instance, and you allow people to do that? You have file already, other file, Databricks uses a file system of their own that stretches over S3 or over file and actually runs really fast on file. So faster than it does on objects. So if you start to look at how things could be built, that's a path forward for them that we're just not seeing that vision out of them this week, which is a little surprising because you had even just a couple weeks ago when we were with Vast, they were talking about this. And same thing with IBM talking about it the week before that. Uh, so you have Dell, IBM, Vast, HPE, with Esmeral all talking about how you bring the data to the storage and make that, the data, the data lake be the storage and not separating those pieces out. I think the difference is, <clears throat> and it's true, m virtually every technology company has been playing with AI or doing AI prior, prior to the open AI you know, announcement of ChatGPT. The difference is, there's a certain sec sector of companies that were basically born to do AI and provide AI services to customers versus those that are embedding AI to make their <clears throat> infrastructure run better or you know, maybe do some chatbotting, whatever. But that's, I think, the difference. Look at Vast. But Vast basically has a platform that is a strong infrastructure for AI, at least ostensibly. IBM obviously has a long heritage in AI, even though they sort of fumbled Watson, but they have a lot of experience there, so they were ready to go take it. To the point about Snowflake, you know, they can kind of bolt on AI because they got the data play. Right. Databricks has always been and they bought, know, deep in AI. And they bought and, Mosaic ML to right. even give it another layer up. Of that. So you have these companies that are, you know, have truly been thinking about how do we deliver AI services to customers, the cloud guys very clearly. Really, it's the three cloud guys and Databricks are the big ones, yeah. and then now OpenAI is shot to the lead as well, just in terms of you know, presence in the market and, and awareness, and then you had a lot of other companies 
Anthropic and Hugging Face and Cohere and uh, you know on and on, C3 AI and Data Robot and all these specialists that are also you know in a pretty Alan good position. Peter, yeah, I mean all yeah. of them. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. And so, you know, they've got good businesses, but but to, to our power law, you're going to have the giants that, and there's going to be a few of those very large language models, and then the the long tail is going to be very highly specific, maybe industry specific models, and they're going to be a lot more of those, but they're going to be a lot smaller. Yeah, I talked to three CIOs so far this week, just in the last two days, about this, and what they were talking about is they're going to be very specific about how they use AI and how they build their models and their LLMs or specialized or segmented language models for doing specific things. So you're going to have, to your point, a long tail of very small models that don't need 10,000 GPUs to go and train. They need a couple, a couple thousand, or not even a thousand, or maybe tens of GPUs, not hundreds of thousands of GPUs. Yeah, and they, uh, Jensen up, sta up on stage today was giving away some GPUs yeah. that were signed by Jensen and Ragu. I do think, I think, do think because Ragu's a you know, technical visionary, I think Jensen respects that. You know, they got the Silicon Valley you know, bromance going. And yeah. So that was kind of cool. They've got five of them they're giving away, or raffling them away, you know, presumably to partners or customers. But uh, Rob, great analysis. Thanks for spending some time on theCUBE. More to come. Yes. Wall to wall coverage this week from VMware Explore. We're live. The Cube's coverage. 2023 VMware Explore. We're right back right after this short break.